to I started sleeping with multiple men. I've never been in a relationship and I've slept with over a hundred, over 150. I lost count of the men that I've slept with. Hi, my name is Madidi Malo Matecha. I am a 28 year old mother of two boys. Born and bred in a small village called Endermak. It's in Limpopo province. Uh, but now I'm currently staying in Bulogwani. In yes, 2008, when uh, I failed, and in 2009, I moved to a public school. I went to a public school and then I think in, in January 2009 I had a quarrel with my mom. I didn't actually really want to go to public school so we had a quarrel and then I decided to commit suicide. I felt like dying because uh, my parents had divorced and I didn't have a relationship with my dad so I felt like my mom my mom was basically just being a mom reprimanding me for being naughty and I took it as if she doesn't love me and I tried to commit suicide luckily enough they found me in time I took pills and then I fell on the streets uh, while walking to a friend's house so they found me and then they took me to hospital flushed out the pills and then School started, I went to a new school, I was this girl, I was the cool girl, I was smoking, I was smoking cigarettes, I was that girl who was always hanging with the boys, I was, I was basically the cool girl, I guess you understand what I'm talking about. Yes, so come March, uh, in March, we had to go, the, um, actually we didn't have to go, I just, it was a normal day, I was like fine, let me go, uh, let me just take a walk, let me take a walk in the neighborhood, while taking a walk I see a cab, loud noise, boys, girls, they're drinking alcohol, they're dancing, and then they're like no, we're going to showgrounds, so if you want to come it's fine, you don't have to pay anything, we've already paid. I was like, okay, fine, let me go, without even telling my mom. Okay, I, I get in there, I hop in the taxi, we go to showgrounds, we are drinking, we are having fun, we're smoking, it's fun, we're having fun. We decide to go to the University of Limpopo. It's in Turf, there was a, a bash happening there. We get there, still the same thing, but then now it was no longer fun because now it's at night, we are cold, uh, there's no alcohol anymore. So it's no longer as fun as it used to be. So I start looking for my transport, how I can't find my transport with, with the other guys. We start looking for it and then no, we can't find it, it's gone. And then people start leaving the, the campus. People are now leaving, they're leaving. And then we decided to stand outside. We like, okay, since it's not here, we'll wait until until the morning and then we'll catch a taxi. So while outside, I'm, I'm the only girl. I was the only girl left. While we're sitting outside, I'm sitting with my homeboys. No, it's fine. I don't have a problem. And then I see this two guys, they were sitting just uh, not far from us, not from far from us. The other one is was I was going to school with him. He was in metric, and then the other one I just knew locally. He was just a local thug. I knew him locally. Fine, they call me. They like no, we can offer you transport. Our taxi is gonna come. I was like no, but I can't leave. I can't go and leave the people that I came with. They were like okay, fine. Then uh, then accompany us. Accompany us to where we're gonna find our transport. I'm like, no, it's late. I can't come back alone. What if something happens to me? And then they're like, no, um, you, you'll you come back, don't worry. And then I started resisting. Then the other guy pulled out a knife and then I, I left with them. While walking there, um, one of his friends came and then when they spoke and then when the friend left i tried to run after the friend and then he took a bottle of beer he hit it on the floor and then he ran after me uh, grabbed me and then he put it on my neck he's like if you try to scream or try to run again i'm gonna cut you with this i'm gonna kill you i became very scared and then i started crying 
there was uh, on our right side there were unfinished houses and then they took me there and then when we got there fine we got there he's like to me um uh who when we got there he he took off his jersey and then he put it on the floor he put the jersey on the floor and then he he was like to me uh stop crying uh we're gonna have sex and then he took off my clothes he took off my 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 pants and then he forced his fingers inside of me i i just i cried louder i cried louder and then the other guy was at the um, at the door, he was he had his phone and then the torch was on. He was watching has what what was happening and then he was also looking for if there was somebody coming so that he can be able to tell him to stop it so that uh, so that he can stop. And then he put the jersey was down and then he was on the floor and then he was like lie down. I was scared of him. I was scared. I was so scared. I thought he was gonna kill me. And then I lied down and then. Uh, he put his condom and then he just started thrusting. He started thrusting. I remember I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't, and he was so heavy. I couldn't get him off me. I could. There was nothing that I could do. I was helpless. I I felt like dying. I I felt like uh, this was the end for me. And his friend was busy looking at us. His, he had his torch on and he was busy looking as if he was enjoying everything that was happening. After he was done, he called the friend. And then the friend was like to me, no bend. I'm like, you forcing yourself onto me and then now you telling me which position you want me to be in. I was like, I am begging you, please don't do this to me. Please don't do this to me. I am begging you, please. Already, already your friend has done this to me. He has forced himself onto me. I can't take it any longer please and then he told the friend he's like yo she doesn't want she doesn't want to talk to her and the friend because i was scared of that other one because he was using he had he told me that he's gonna kill me the friend came he's like no you're gonna sleep with him you're gonna sleep you're gonna do what i tell you to do so i was like no i, I okay at least let me not bend and then i just lied down and then he also did what he wanted to do my friend didn't know that I was getting raped. When I left, he just thought that I left with them. He didn't know that they were going to rape me. He thought that they had gotten transports and then I went home with them. Okay, I, I dressed up and then it was clearing up outside. The sun was coming out. I am still crying. I am shaking. I, I am hysterical. I'm numb. I was numb. I was very, very numb because it was cold. It was very, very cold and I didn't have a jersey on. So I, I was just, I was numb. I was numb and then we walked to, uh, uh, we walk outside the gate of the university. And then when we get there, I'm still crying. The guys are, they are surprised. But why, why is he crying? So when we came back, he, when we came back, he was surprised. And then the guys called him and then they spoke to him. And then after that, after speaking to them, he came straight away to me because I was, I was crying. I was crying hysterically. And then he was like, I told them the story. And then we went to the security guards. We told, we told them the story. They called the police and we continued to to leave they didn't the guys didn't know what was going on we didn't want to alert them that we had called the cops because i was still scared that they, he might kill me he might do something violent so while walking to the robots to go get the taxis the police come and then they arrest them and they take me with when we get to the police station there is uh, they take they put them in the holding cell so while these guys are in the holding cell i am just right here next to the holding cell and i have to tell my statement i'm still very numb i'm still very shaken up i am still crying i am traumatized and i have to give a statement right next to the people that did this to me fine i gave my statement as hard as it was because at first the police didn't believe me the woman that was it was a woman that was taking my statement she kept on saying that where were you going 
because I, I was 16 then I was 16 in 2009 so she kept asking where were you going uh, because uh, you go outside you go out there and you you these things happen to you and then you come to us and you report them and you want us to feel sympathy for you 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 did this to yourself and then finally she takes the statement I tell her my story she takes the statement after that she takes me to hospital and then when I get to hospital I also have to wait I waited for a long time and then when the doctor got there he did the test kit he did everything um, it was also not nice I, I don't like what they do to to get the evidence and all of that I don't like it because you feeling pain from people having forcefully uh, having people force themselves onto you you're still feeling pain your vagina is still sore and then they have to put things inside of you just to take tests you still traumatized I didn't like that experience at all I didn't like it then after that the the policewoman came now she was a bit sympathetic now after the test and all of that she was a bit sympathetic and then I got home when I when I get home my mom is scared my mom starts shouting because she doesn't know what happened she starts shouting at me because she thought that maybe I had been arrested so she starts shouting at me I didn't even talk to her I went straight to my room I took off those clothes and then I locked myself in the bathroom I, I started bathing I cried I cried I cried as, as I was pouring the water I screamed so hard I cried I cried and I just sat in the bathtub and I bathed she she was and then I, I, I just I bathed I bathed and the woman left the police woman left and then when i got out my mom my mom is old my mom is from the villages and she didn't know how to deal with the situation she didn't know what to say to me she didn't know how to offer me support she was i think as a mom she was also traumatized as well so we just spoke about the arvs that they gave me uh, and how to take them and all of that so the next day I had to go to school and when I go when I get to school everybody at school knew everybody at school knew the guys called people back home and they told them that I slept with them and of course people were gonna believe them because I was that girl that was smoking that was I was naughty already so people had that thing of ah she's a bitch she sleeps with them and then she she reports the case. She says that they raped them. When I got there, everybody was looking at me like I, I was a slut. People were just, I was slut shamed basically. Nobody wanted to offer any support to me except for my class teacher and this one boy that I was, um, I think close to, not really close, but then I was able to talk to him. He understood. He, he understood me and he was able to listen so it was it was very hard for me because back then the ARVs would make you very sick I would I was always nauseous and dizzy and all of that but my class teacher took she took really good care of me she took really good care of me I'm not gonna lie after that I I gave my life to substances I gave my life to substances and rape victims we usually talk about what's been done to us we never talk about what we did what 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 are the what were the outcomes because i'm not gonna stand here and try to be perfect because i i wasn't as well and i'm not gonna blame the whole rape situation on how my life turned out no i had a choice i had a choice to go to counseling and to uh, change my life there and there and to become a better person but I chose to give my life to substances I started sleeping with multiple men I've never been in a relationship and I've slept with over a hundred over 150 I lost count of the 
men that I've slept with. I chose to give my life to, to substances. I started drinking. I started, of course, I was already smoking cigarettes. I dabbled into weed now. I started becoming addicted to weed. Uh, parties, I used to have house parties. I disrespected my mom. My mom, I became a very disrespectful child. Started disrespecting my mom, my mother. Didn't take school seriously. I didn't take anything seriously. I became promiscuous. I started dressing like a whore, basically. I started dressing like a whore. I behaved like a whore. I spoke like a whore. I, I was a never mind. I didn't care about anyone. I didn't, and I didn't care about anything. And I went out of my way to hurt people. I basically didn't care. So as I, I went on in 2011, I. I was with a friend, he came to visit, my mom wasn't home. So he came to visit, we outside in his car, he gives me a, a beer, he's also drinking one, and then we start smoking. After that, he locks his car. He locks his car and then I'm like, Tim, why are you locking your car? And then he takes, he, he pulls my hands down and then he climbs on top of me. And then I start crying. I'm like, why, why, why are you doing this? What are you doing? He, he isn't even saying anything to me. He isn't even saying anything to me. And then he, um, he takes his seat down, his car seat down so that I can be in a lying position. And then he takes off my pants and then he unzips his. He's on top of me, he's very heavy. And I can't, I can't fight him off. I am screaming. I can't, my voice can't be loud because he's on top of me. There is literally nothing that I can do. And then he just, he didn't even use a condom. He didn't even care to use a condom. And then he just, he starts, he forced himself onto me. He started thrusting. He went on and on. I cried. I was hitting him. I kept on saying no, but he just couldn't stop up until he finished. After he finished, I got out of, out of the car and I left. I, I opened the gate and I went straight home. I went to the bathtub. I bathed, I bathed, I bathed, I bathed. I cried, I cried, and then I went to I went to sleep. The next day I went to school. I was 18. I was, yes, I was 18 when that happened. After that, okay, I was like, I'm not gonna report it. I, I hate that whole experience. I hate that whole process. And the fact that nothing is happening, we just go to court and they keep on postponing. And the trauma that I face every time I go to, uh, to court, I don't wanna face that again. I don't wanna go through that again. So I went to the doctor because I know the procedure. I know that you have to go to the doctor and they have to clean you. Uh, I also need to get ARVs and I don't want to fall pregnant. I go to the doctor. I get uh, all the medication. The doctor advised me to report the case. I told him I can't. And then he said, I respect your privacy. A month after that, I get sick. I start getting sick and I, uh, I see that I miss my periods. I go to the doctor again, the same doctor. When I get there, he does test and then he's like, you're pregnant. Like, how can I be pregnant when um, I took, you gave me morning after pills and all of that. But I, I had, there was somebody that I was seeing then and I was having sex with them. So you, I became confused. I was like, okay, if I'm pregnant, where is it coming from? Who, who is the baby daddy? But I was like, you know what? I'm gonna stick to my guts. It must be the guy that I'm seeing. It can't be from rape. I can't be carrying a child from rape. When my mom found out, found out that I was pregnant, she was like, no, you're keeping this child. Because if you are bored, I'm just giving you a card to go wild. So you're keeping this child, you're gonna become a mother. I was in grade 11 by then. I was repeating my grade 11. Fine, throughout the, the whole pregnancy was it was hell. It was depressing because the guy I was seeing as well, he denied, he kept on denying the child. He was like, this can't be my child. You, you were sleeping around. You were a whore. I can't trust you. So it wasn't nice. It wasn't a nice experience. I gave birth immediately after giving birth, after my C-section healed, 
I went back into the streets, started smoking again, went back to drinking. This time I became worse. Sleep, the sleeping around became worse. Um, the, and I wasn't using a, a condom. With all the sleeping around with different people, I wasn't using a condom at all. And then I started dabbling into drugs. I started using cat. I started with cat. I started using cat. And then after cat, um, I went on to cocaine. So in I gave birth in 2012, 2013, I go to varsity. While there in, um, in June, yes, in June, I, I go home, I'm home, and then I find that I, I'm sick. I tell my mom that I think that I'm pregnant. I go to a woman's clinic, and then they find that I'm 19 weeks pregnant. They're like, we don't do top. We don't do top. We, we can't uh, have this abortion. So they recommended us to go to another doctor. We go to that doctor, that doctor is like, no, it's fine. I'll do the whole process. He gave me the pills. I went home and then when I got home, I had to go through, I, I literally gave birth. I literally gave birth uh, and I had to flush the baby. It was very traumatic. After that, that's when I was like, cat wasn't enough. And then I, I went to, I started doing cocaine. I started doing cocaine, fine, it's 2013, 2014, I'm busy with the life, so I don't even care about school, you know. I was doing a one-year course and I failed, uh, but I still went back to school in 2014 because my, my siblings and my mom, they never gave up on me. They never, ever, ever gave up on me. So I, I find out that I'm pregnant again. This is now my third pregnancy. So I go ahead with the backstreet abortion. After the abortion, I go on with my life, the drinking, that lifestyle. And I wasn't, I, I'd like to put this on record, I wasn't a slave queen, I was never a slave queen. I was a whore, I was a dirty whore. Those girls that you find on the streets that don't love themselves, they hardly wear nice clothes, who smoke anything and drink drink yeah I, 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 I was I was just a whore luckily I had beautiful friends and they were able to introduce me to uh, the nicer side of life so most places I went through association of the friends that I had so yes and then in 2015 January I start getting sick my urine is now yellow I, I just thought I, I turned yellow everything started turning yellow um, I did tests. My brother took me to um, a private doctor. He was like, I hope this is not what I think it is because if it is, you are dying. I did tests and it proved him right. He was right. He was like, no, you actually have hepatitis B. He gave us a referral letter to Baraguana. He was like, they have to admit you this. You need help urgent help it's a sexually transmitted disease that doesn't have a cure so when we got to bara it was full my brother decided to take me home we get home my mom took me to uh province the provincial hospital when we got there they were like there's nothing we can do for you there are no beds here you are basically dying you have limited time to leave so just go home and try to do more research on the virus and try to cope with it and uh, prepare your family so i went home my mom said no we're going to our family doctor we get to the family doctor he was like no he was very calmly so i love that doctor calmly so he's like no no this is nothing you're gonna defeat this we're basically gonna give you supplements to boost your immune system once your immune system uh, is, is strong enough it'll be able to fight the virus and you will be fine and indeed he did that. He gave me supplements, vitamins, multivitamins, your folic acids, you no know, normal vitamins, very cheap. I'd start taking those vitamins. And because of the faith that he gave me that I'm going to get well, I took that and I ran with it. I told my mom I want a Bible. My mom bought me a Bible. I also bought some spiritual books. And then I came across the prayer of salvation. And then I got saved. As time went on, I started healing. I changed my lifestyle, started eating healthy, started exercising. Then there, I started drinking water. And then 
I became well. I, I, I healed physically. I healed. And then I decided that, okay, I'm going to motivate young people with my story. But the mistake that I made was that I didn't heal emotionally. All the those emotional scars from the rape, everything that had happened to me, I didn't take time to heal. I... I was telling my story, I was now going to a church, but because I didn't heal, slowly but surely, it started with the weed, went back to smoking weed, and then went back to drinking, then went back to sleeping around, but I was still, you know, I kept it private. I kept it private, I was still doing my speaking and all of that. But I saw that it wasn't working out. It wasn't working out, so I decided to stop. And then uh, in 2017, January 2017, I was with a guy from church. We liked talking. So I go to his place while we're there. He initiates sex. He initiates sex, and I say I'm not comfortable with it. He forced himself onto me. Um, a week from that, I go out with uh, with an ex boyfriend. While uh, while out, we decide to book. In the morning, he initiates sex. I said I don't want it. I'm not comfortable. And then he forced himself onto me. And then a few days from that on, I am also with a friend. He is a guy. Uh, we were just chilling, we were chilling and then he initiated sex as well. I said no and then he forced himself onto me, luckily enough he stopped. So all this happened in such little time that I had a breakdown. I went mad, I went crazy, I wasn't coping at all. I left the church, I deactivated all my social media accounts, I just... I wanted to die. I wasn't coping. I wasn't coping at all. I was seeing things. I was saying things. Uh, I tried to get help from a lady that had a that has a non-profit organization. It's called Direst. She tried to help me, and then I, I disappeared from her as well. And then I just I went back into the world. I found comfort in substances. This time I started dating older men, but I wasn't. I wasn't making any money from it. I was just I would get 100 rands. They would just sleep with me for for the man for the they would give me booze and the drugs because that's what I loved most. So in in 2018, yes, 2018 I was like I I can't do this anymore. This is after I, I had slept with this man, this other man, and then he gave me 350. I'm like, this isn't, this isn't working out for me. People are making money from this. People are going to Dubai. Like, they are making real money, and I'm not making any money from it. Why am I doing it? What's the use? So I decided to stop, and I decided to just stay at home, get myself a normal boyfriend, somebody younger. Maybe he wouldn't come with problems. So yes, uh, luckily I got a job and then while working there, I was still drinking, I was still doing the whole drinking, smoking. It wasn't a healthy environment. I struggled at, at work. I even lost one of my best friends while working there because I was working with her. I got unfairly dismissed at work because the boss didn't like me. I told on him. I saw that he was treating women unfairly. He would get um, the ladies at work to sleep with him and then he would say I would I will extend the contract. So my contract ended fine, but because one of uh, our manager liked that liked me, she liked me. I came back in 2019. I I went back to work. I went back to work and then I fell pregnant. When I fell pregnant, it was it wasn't easy at all. I was like, oh my god, I'm not have this one. I'm not killing things were not okay at home they were not okay at, at home at, nothing was okay in my life i was like i'm gonna rededicate my life to god i'm gonna rededicate my life to god i don't have a reason to keep this pregnancy but i am gonna keep this pregnancy 
I am going to keep my baby. I started losing friends slowly but surely. I started losing friends. And then throughout the pregnancy, I was sick because I had to go through the withdrawal symptoms of, of the weed, the alcohol, and the cigarette smoking. I was very sick. I even lost weight. Fine, I went through that. I eventually I lost my best friend. I broke up with the guy that I was dating because the relationship was just toxic and it being toxic, I he was still smoking weed and I didn't want to do it anymore. I, I just I couldn't anymore. I was done. I didn't want I didn't want that lifestyle anymore. So in November I went on maternity leave. I went on maternity leave in December. I gave birth to my baby boy and I decided to name him Tume Tumelo, which is faith because I had no reason to keep him, but I said that you know what, God has a plan for this child and God has a plan for my life. Okay, I gave birth in December. So in 2020, I went through the process of transformation. I told myself that I'm never, ever, ever going back there. I'm never, ever, 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 ever going back to that, to that lifestyle. God kept me. God kept me. God has saved me throughout everything that I went through. God has forgiven me. God loves me. So it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy because I didn't receive my money for maternity leave. UIF told me that the re uh, reference that they got from uh, the company that I was working for is, is incorrect. And when they keep contacting them, they are not getting back to them. And to a point whereby they stopped answering, answering their numbers. I was in debt. I was in debt. I was broken. I had no friend. I had no boyfriend. It was just me and my kids. It was just me, my kids and my mother. But I decided that I am going to be a mother to my child. I am going to be a sister to my two brothers and my two sisters. I am going to be um, an aunt to my nephews and my nieces. I'm going to be a good example to my nieces. I don't want them to turn out the way that I turned out. I was like, there has to be something to this life. There has to be something. Something has to, to give. I can't suffer like this. I can't. I, I can't, not anymore, not anymore. So yes, while going through the process of uh, transformation, I, I was like, you know what, let me just write. Because I, I was writing, I was writing everything that I was going through. I, I had a diary. I was like, let me just turn my diary into a book. That is how 2020 Dear Diary came about. And then through that, I was like, okay, I have a book. How am I going to market it? So I decided to go back into social media. I had no friends. I, I, I had no plan whatsoever of how I'm going to market it. And then I decided to start a YouTube channel as well. I was like, no, there must be women that went through what I was going through. And if they could just relate, they will find hope and um, they can be able to save their lives and they can be able to overcome what they are going through so i started in my youtube channel i go into detail about every single thing that i am going through and then in tra in transformation my npo how it came about is that i didn't have an environment i saw that okay fine church the world rejected me i went to church and church also rejected me so i was like i want to create an environment for people who want to change their lives i want to create a, a healthy environment for them. I want to offer them skills and resources to be able to transform their lives. I want to offer them the counseling, the sponsorship and the funding that they need. For those who want to go back to school, they can go back to school. For those that uh, want to become better citizens, they can do all of that. So that is how my NPO came about. So yes, that is my story. I have been through the most, but it's, it's just the beginning. This is just the beginning. God has transformed my life. I am beautiful today because of God. God washed me. He cleansed me. I am who I am today because of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have overcame it by myself. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be here. Just by the name of Jesus Christ, not a pastor, not a mentor, not anybody, just Jesus Christ, just God, just God, just God. And yes, that is my story. Hi, my name is Madidi Malo Matecha, and I have been through the most, from a whole to wholeness.